Om Sri Sthairam. I offer my humble pranams at the lotus feet of our dear Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba. Respected elders, dear brothers and sisters, Sai Ram to all of you and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, which focuses on ear, nose and throat problems. Our speaker today is Mr. Baskar Ram, who is an ear, nose and throat consultant. Dr. Baskar Ram graduated from the University of Madras in India. He did a one year fellowship in rhinology at Melbourne, Australia, and has been a practicing consultant since 2002. Dr. Ram is a consultant otolaryngologist at the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary in Scotland with special interest in rhinoplasty, advanced endoscopic sinus surgery, autology surgery, dizziness management, facial pain management, chronic cough management, and immunotherapy. Dr. Ram is the course director for the Scottish ENT update course, facial pain symposium course, and course on practical management of allergy and management of difficult airway. Dr. Ram has been a devotee of Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba for many years and is currently Region 8 President. He has been fortunate to work and carry out ENT surgery at the Super Specialty Hospital in Prashanti Nilayam for the past eight years and has been blessed to go to medical camps in several countries with Dr. Upadhyaya. I now hand over to Mr. Ram. Thank you, Santa. Thank you, Sai Ram. My humble pranams at the lotus feet of our beloved Bhagwan, Sai Ram. Respected elders, ladies, gentlemen, dear brothers and sisters, a very good evening to you. Some of you might have worked very hard, must have had a long day. I hope this lecture will be uh, interesting and keeps you motivated to go through. Uh, I would firstly like to offer my pranams to four people. My thanks to four people. First is to our beloved Bhagwan for giving this opportunity to give the talk and also to be with all of you. Secondly, to Gayatri Madam for inviting me for this lecture. Thirdly, to Brother Krishna Sir and Senta for hosting this and co-hosting this event. And last but not the least, Brother Tushar, who organizes all these media, who works so tirelessly behind the scene. With this, I will start my presentation, Saira. Uh, so my name is Mr. Bhaskar Ram. I live in Aberdeen. So the, here we see the Aberdeen. On a good sunny day, it's a lovely beach to go to, but most of the time it's a wee bit cold. We have um, Nazi oil, um, and we have been doing reasonably well because of the oil. Our queen used to visit to the Balmoral Castle, as you can see on the lower left scene, but otherwise it's a lovely place to be, and it is not very crowded and pleasant to live in. This is the uh, children's part of the hospital that you're seeing. Uh, this is the hospital where I work. So the, for this talk, the main aims are these. What are the common ENT problems that we come across in our primary care? And I will give you some tips to know when to see your GP. And also we will discuss and some important ENT emergencies that you need to be aware of so you can contact your GP as soon as possible and get the right treatment. As you know, ENT is ear, nose and throat. So I will start with the ear conditions. Now, sorry for this tight slide. This is a slide of the anatomy of the ear. So if anybody wants to know, all it is is it consists of three parts, the outer ear, which is the blue part, and then we have the middle ear, which consists of the ossicles, the yellow part, and the inner ear, which contains the snail-like structure that is called as the cochlea, 
that's a very important organ for hearing. And then you see them some circles and they are the semicircular canals, they control the balance. So in summary, the main function of the ear is to support hearing and also to provide balance or uh, balance to our body. So these are the two main functions of the ear. Now, when you go and see your GP in the clinic, the doctor always looks inside with the horoscope. So you never know what you're seeing, but this is exactly what he looks at. He looks at the nice, shiny drum, eardrum, and you see a beautiful, uh, uh, shiny thing coming out that is called as the cone of light reflex. That means this is a healthy uh, eardrum, okay? So what is the most common problem in the ear that we come across? It is wax. Some, it is natural for us to produce wax. It is natural for the ear to clear the wax on its own. We don't have to put cotton buds. We don't have to clean it regularly every day. But some people produce more wax than others. So one of the common simple solution is get some wax drops, the cerimol drops or sodium bicarbonate drops from the counter and you can use them two or three drops uh, a week. Uh, maybe put one or two drops every alternate days, or you can use simple olive oil. Uh, so these are the two main common things we tend to use in, uh, we recommend. Of course, there will be some patient where the wax is very hard, very blocked. Then you can get it either syringed privately, or if you come to the ENT clinic, we can remove the wax for you. Okay, so the number of people requiring impacted wax is not very high. Most people don't need ear cleaning. And we strongly recommend people not to use cotton buds because it will push the wax more deeper and your ear gets really blocked, okay? The other common things we come across in the ear is like this sponge being put in the ear in children's or you can get a bead stuck in the ear canal. Uh, usually when children's play, they put all these beads or they can put a stone inside the ear. So these are the common foreign bodies that we come across in our day-to-day -day practice. Now, when there is a foreign body or a very impacted wax, then they come to our clinic. Our, we have a special nurse who looks into the ear with the microscope and uses these special instruments to clean and remove the wax or even the foreign body, okay? Children's, it's, it can be difficult to remove them, so they generally might need a general anesthesia to remove these foreign bodies. Now I'm going to go through a number of cases for you to understand. Um, just give me a second, I'll just, yeah. So the first case is a 22 year old patient. Uh, he goes to Spain on a holiday. While he's in a holiday and he's swimming a lot, he develops severe itching in his right ear. And a day or two later, he starts developing severe pain. So he goes and sees the local doctor, emergency doctor. and who looks inside the ear and he finds a very inflamed looking ear canal and a lot of debris. So this condition is called otitis externa or external ear canal infection. So the treatment for this is one, don't get water into the ears. He would prescribe uh, topical antibiotic drops. The drug of choice is a drug called ciprofloxacin. It is very effective against a bug called pseudomonas and you got to use it twice daily for 10 days, okay? So this is uh, case number one. Let us look at the case number two. Here is a three-year-old child who develops a cold, okay? Two days later, starts developing severe pain in the right ear. Now the mother checks the temperature, the child is miserable, crying a lot, in a lot of pain, and the temperature is also high, the child is restless, so the mother takes the child to her GP. The GP looks inside the ear, and when you remember the normal looking drum I showed you in the beginning, and look at this drum. This drum is very red, very inflamed. It's about to burst. So no wonder the child is in a lot of pain. So this condition is called acute otitis media, okay? It's an acute ear infection. So the treatment for this is painkillers paracetamol for the fever. And if the symptoms of fever and pain last for more than four days to five days, the GPs normally would give some antibiotics 
uh, and the pain settles down, the temperature comes down, the infection resolves. Sometimes the drum may perforate and it starts discharging. Since the pus is now getting released, the ear gets uh, better very soon, okay? So the treatment for acute otitis media is painkillers, paracetamol, and maybe antibiotics if the symptoms last for more than four to five days. Let us look at another case. Here is a case number three. Let us say a mother notices that her three-year-old daughter is sitting very close to the telly and it's not answering when spoken to and the TV is too loud and the, child, mom, and the child keeps on repeating what, what, that means there is some suspicion the child is not hearing so well. So the mother is obviously concerned, takes the daughter to her GP. The doctor has a look, a look in the ear and here you find the, there are a lot of air bubbles behind the drum. So this condition is called as the glue ear or otitis media with effusion. In simple terms, it's a glue ear. So the GP refers to us and we do a hearing test. The one on the right, I don't know whether you can see my arrow, sorry, the one on the left is your normal hearing test. You see the number 20. So any hearing above the line 20 means it's a normal hearing. Red is for the right ear, blue is for the left ear. And it, this is a normal audiogram, a normal hearing test. Now let's look at the child's hearing test. It is not normal. It is way down to 40 to 50 decibels. So there is obviously a drop of hearing from this line, 20 down to 40 decibels. And uh, so this confirms this child to have your glue ear with a hearing loss. So the treatment for this is grommet insertion or ventilation tube insertion, and the hearing comes back instantaneously the procedure is usually done under general anesthesia. This uh, grommet usually falls out after nine months spontaneously. We don't have to take it out. It comes out on its own. It gives rest to the middle ear and uh, the hearing improves. Some children will require one set of grommets. Some children may require more than one set. It varies from patient to patient. But usually this is the treatment for a glue ear. Now let us look at this scenario. Here is a 30 year old patient who has been noticing recurrent discharge from his ear for the last six months. He tries to keep water out of the ears. He tries to keep it dry, but it's been discharging on and on and on. Uh, it is painless. There is no pain. There is no fever. So he goes to see his doctor. When, he, when the doctor looks into the ear on the, on, this, on the left side, you see a normal tympanic membrane but compare this to this one, here there is a big perforation. So this is a perforated eardrum. There is no discharge at the moment. So this patient is got an ear perforation. And the, as the symptoms have been ongoing for the last six months, the doctor will refer a patient to us. We will try some drops first. If it doesn't work, we would recommend an operation. It is not a major operation. It is a general anesthesia procedure and you can get an excellent result once you cover this hole with a graft, okay? So the treatment is closure of the perforation with an operation, okay? So this condition is just a simple ear, ear uh, drum perforation. Let us look at this case. A 25 year old businessman, uh, he's doing absolutely fine, wakes up one morning and he tries to answer a telephone call and he finds that he can't hear so well in the right ear. So he puts the phone on the left ear and he can hear perfectly. So he kind of wonders what is going on here. He is concerned and he can't hear at all in his right ear. So he goes and sees his GP. The GP looks into the ear and he says there is no wax and uh, the ear canal and the drum looks absolutely normal. And then he finds the patient still can't hear in his right ear. So he immediately refers the patient to us and we do an urgent hearing test. Now in the right, in the left ear, the blue bit, I told you, it is a normal hearing. Whereas in the right ear, the hearing should be here. It has dropped down to 50 decibels, okay? So this condition, is an uh, emergency. 
The reason it is emergency is you only have a window period of 72 hours, that is three days. If you don't act on it, you will lose the hearing completely. So it is, you're not going to get back your hearing. So this is one condition where a patient has to act fast. The GP also had to act fast to preserve the hearing. So when you come to us, when we see this, this condition is called sudden sensory neural hearing loss. That means there is some damage to the cochlea and the nerve to the cochlea. So the treatment is oral steroids and steroid injections into the middle ear. So this is an emergency condition uh, where a GP has to act fast. So the window period is only 72 hours. If you lose this period, it's very difficult to get the hearing back to its normal level, okay? Now let us look at this case. Um, this is a common scenario we see very frequently. I'm sure some of the senior people would have also noticed this. So 65 year old man notices that he can't hear so clearly in the meetings. So he goes to his GP, GP says, okay, let's get a hearing test. And you can see uh, the normal hearing should be here. And these are the low frequencies. These are the high frequencies. As you go to the high frequency, there is a dip going down in the right ear and the left ear. They are symmetrical. So this is what we call an age related hearing loss. And the treatment for this is a hearing aid. Nowadays, you can get a free hearing test in Specsavers and they will do the hearing test and they will also guide you through a hearing aid if required. The hearing aid will help you to hear better, will reduce the tinnitus. You can hear and you can cope well in the meetings. So it's got a loop system. So hearing aid is a solution for this. And so that's what I'm showing you in this slide, okay? Now, let us look at this scenario. A 40-year-old male wakes up one morning very, very dizzy. Uh, sorry, uh, it has to be he or she, sorry about that. She's unable to get out of her bed. She's very dizzy and she's very, very sick. So here is a 40-year-old female who wakes up one morning very dizzy. She was absolutely fine the day before. Maybe had a very mild cold. But that's about it. But next day she can't get out of her bed. She's very dizzy, she is sick, and she's vomiting all the time. So she calls the GP who comes, examines the patient and gives a stomatal injection, and then gives some stomatal tablets, five milligrams three times a day, and says, you better get some rest. And the dizziness gradually gets better over 10 days. So this acute event of dizziness lasting for a good 10 days with recurrent spells of dizziness is called as labyrinthitis. That means it's an inflammation of the inner ear, so the patient is very, very dizzy. It is usually caused by a viral infection. You don't need to take antibiotics. All you need is a stomatal injection to suppress the vomiting and some stomatal tablets to cope over the dizziness. The brain slowly compensates and you get better over time. So this is a self-limiting condition. But the dizziness may take uh, a few weeks sometimes to settle down because the brain is compensating for this insult to the labyrinth. So don't be surprised that if you are a little bit lightheaded for a few weeks, even after the acute incident, acute event. Now let us look at this scenario. 65-year-old patient notices that his head starts spinning whenever he looks up to pick something off the shelf or when he lies down at night and turns to the right. So here's a patient, he goes to the kitchen and he tries to look up to pick something off the shelf and he feels momentarily dizzy. And then when he goes back and lies down in bed, every night, he, whenever he turns to the right, he feels dizzy. The dizziness, unlike the previous one, doesn't have any nausea or vomiting. It only lasts for a few seconds. It doesn't last for days. So this dizziness, is called as BPPV, benign, paroxysmal, positional, vertigo. Uh, you don't have to know the name, just remember the word BPPV. Yeah, here is a dizziness which lasts only for a few seconds. The reason this person gets dizziness is because there are small particles, calcium particles floating inside this balance organ and they get dislodged and whenever they move around, the patient gets dizzy, okay? So the treatment for this is a simple exercise called Epley exercise, uh, which your ENT doctor 
some GPs are expert and they'll be able to provide this exercise for you. And once you do once or twice, they, you're cured. You basically push the particles back to its normal place with this Epley exercise and you're cured. You don't need any medications. You don't need antibiotics. You don't need stomatal injections. You don't need stomatal tablets. All you need is this simple exercise to cure your dizziness. So this condition is called BPPV, okay? Now, this is another common scenario we quite uh, frequently come across. A uh, uh, 50 year old patient slowly starts developing a buzzing noise in her ears. It is bilateral. That means it's in both ears. It's been gradually getting worse. And she also notices that hearing is also slowly going down. So this noise that she hears is called as tinnitus. Some people hear this tinnitus like a buzzing of insects. Some people hear it as a running engine. Some people hear it as a metal grinding against metal. Some people hearing as a wind-like noise or a fan-like noise or a hissing like a tea kettle and so on. So, so this patient that we discussed has hearing loss, has tinnitus or the buzzing noise. So the GP will recommend for a hearing test or refer the patient to us. And just like in the previous case, you see that the right ear and the left ear, they are sloping down for the high frequency. So this patient has got uh, hearing loss in both ears. And the treatment for this is a hearing aid because it will improve the background noise and reduce the tinnitus. And also if the noise is still there, you can listen to some soft music. There are some tinnitus apps. You can buy, download it off the internet in your mobile and you can use this to drown the tinnitus noise. So the treatment for tinnitus, if you have a hearing loss, your hearing aid is definitely going to help you. If you only have the noise and your hearing is not bad, then you can use one of these apps to help you with your tinnitus. Now, some people will develop noise only in one ear. For example, they will say, Mr. Ram, I can, I, my hearing is normal. I only hear this buzzing noise in my right ear and I don't hear anything in the left ear. I don't hear this noise. So this is one condition when you have hearing uh, tinnitus only in one ear, then the GP should rec rec uh, refer the patient to us. We will get an MRI scan because there are some benign growths in the brain which can cause tinnitus. So when you have tinnitus only, only in one ear, you should see your GP and your GP should refer this patient to us for a scan, okay? That covers the ear section. We will go on to the nose part. So let us look at this scenario. 35 year old patient, uh, sustains a nasal trauma following an assault. So he goes to the pub, he was involved in an accident and that's how his nose looks. So he's been really punched from the right side. His nasal bones are twisted. He may have some nosebleed. So obviously he needs to be rushed off to the A&E, uh, accident emergency department and bad the doctors will put some injection and push the nose back in place. Sometimes they do it immediately. Sometimes they wait for all the swelling to settle down. Preferably they do it within uh, a week to 10 days, okay? So this is a broken nose. Treatment is uh, a an, an, an local anesthesia and repositioning those bones back to its normal place. And it is usually done in the emergency department. Sometimes they may refer to the ENT department and we can do it for them as well. Now, here is another case, a 40 year old man uh, who is a non-smoker who complained of a blocked nose and loss of smell and recurrent sneezing. So this has been ongoing for the last year. He also has a history of asthma. Uh, so he goes to see his GP and the GP looks inside the nose and he sees like grape-like structures inside the nose. So these grape-like structures are called polyps. They block the nose. They cause loss of smell. They usually don't cause any nosebleeds. They usually don't cause any facial pain. So the patient usually finds that his nose sounds very blocked. 
his partner might say, look, why are you feeling so blocked in your nose? And it is gradual. It's not uh, due to any cold or anything. And it's a completely blocked nose. They, they lose their sense of smell. They can't taste their food properly. So this condition is called nasal polyps. Uh, now, one of the causes for these polyps are allergy related. So they, the GP can do a skin prick test or the ENT doctor can do a skin prick test to see what they are allergic to like grass, trees, pollens, cats, dogs, house dust mite, etc. So the treatment for this nasal polyps are because they are allergy related, we would give them uh, oral steroids, nasal steroid drops and antihistamines. Um, so these are the three main medical treatment they, which a GP will try to shrink those polyps. If after six weeks to three months they don't shrink, he will refer them to us. We will get a CT scan. This black thing is the normal CT scan. A normal scan should be, these, uh, these are the sinuses, they should be black, they should be filled with air. On, in, in contrast, you can see at this scan, it is complete whitewash, it's completely blocked. So this is a condition with polyps, chronic sinusitis with polyps, and it is they, all the sinuses are completely blocked. So this is the scan which we would do. And then we would, uh, if they have failed medical treatment, we would recommend an operation called polypectomy or endoscopic sinus surgery. In the early years, uh, in before 1980s, we used to do a lot of polyps, just remove the polyps. But nowadays we have better gadgets. We go right into the sinuses and uh, we do this operation called endoscopic sinus surgery or ESS. It's called ESS, okay? Now let's look at this scenario. Here is a 10 year old boy who develops a cold, fine. But then mother notices a few days later, the right eye is slowly starting to swell up. So mom thinks, is the child having an eye infection? What is going on here? The child takes the, so the mother takes the child to the GP. The GP uh, is a very smart GP. Instantly he puts two and two together. Here is a child with a cold and the eye swelling. Immediately he picks the phone and speaks to us and say, look, doctor, this child has got orbital cellulitis, infection of the eye, and it's a secondary to sinusitis. So please see what's going on. Immediately we will see this patient. We will get a CT scan. And you can see in the CT scan, there is pus here sitting there. So this patient has got orbital cellulitis. So the treatment for this is an emergency referral. Uh, we would get a second opinion also from the eye doctors. We will do an urgent CT scan. We will give them IV antibiotics and we will drain that pus from the sinuses and also from the eye. So this condition is called as orbital cellulitis, orbital abscess with sinusitis, okay? Moving on, uh, let us say a 40 year old man develops a cold. Uh, say two to three days later, he starts developing a uh, uh, nosebleed. Uh, it is only on the right side. When he, every time he touches his nose, his nose starts bleeding. So he goes to see his doctor. The GP uh, has a look in the nose and he finds on the right side where the bleeding was coming from, there are some uh, bleeding point. So he said, don't worry, I will sort it out for you. So he picks up this... Uh, stick called as a silver nitrate stick. It is coated with silver nitrate. He goes to the bleeding point and just put some local uh, anesthetic spray, numbs it a little bit, and then touches those bleeding points and he cures the patient. He, the, he then says, why don't you use the nasetin cream? This cream will reduce the crusting and he'll make things heal faster. So the treatment for simple minor nosebleed uh, from the septum is cautery and naseptin cream. Now, one word of caution for naseptin, it has got peanut oil. So make sure when you're having this cream that you're not allergic to peanuts. Otherwise you'll be going straight to emergency department for anaphylaxis, okay? Now let us look at this patient. Uh, 80 year old patient, uh, one night suddenly starts bleeding from the nose. The history is she's a known hypertensive. She had a heart attack two years ago. She's taking the blood thinner tablets. 
So the, obviously the relatives are concerned. She's 80 year old, bleeding badly, not simple bleed. It is pouring away. So they take the patient to a &E by the ambulance. In ambulance, so when they go to a &E, the doctors will check the vital signs, take a good history, and then they will pack the nose. This is called as the rapid rhino pack. It is a pack which is put into the nose. The patient is obviously admitted into the hospital. These packs are put on both sides, and then they will monitor the pulse, the blood pressure, and uh, stop the blood thinner tablets for a day or two, and then they remove the pack after 24 hours. Okay, so this is the treatment for a severe nosebleed. If the patient still continues to bleed despite the pack, then we may have to take the patient to theater to stop the nosebleed. But this is the treatment for a severe nosebleed. Moving on, um, this is again a quite a frequent uh, scenario that we come across. Let us say a young patient develops symptoms of severe sneezing and congestion. Uh, she says, uh, doctor, it's pretty bad during summer. My hay fever season is pretty big. I hate uh, the hay fever season. I can't play tennis outdoors. I can't take my dog for a walk. And I love my pets at home. Uh, so, and I can't study so well during summer because my nose is uh, blocked. I'm sneezing all the time. Is there anything you can do for me? So the doctor say, so this condition is called allergic rhinitis. Some people are allergic only during the summer season or the hay fever season. Some people are allergic throughout the year. Okay. So one is called seasonal allergic rhinitis in, and other one is called the perennial allergic rhinitis. Okay. So these are the two types. Some people are allergic to grass and trees and pollen. Some people are allergic to dogs and cats. Some people are allergic to house dust mite. So that, uh, how do we know what they're allergic to? So the GP will say, I can do a skin prick test to see what you're allergic to. And if you look at the hand on this side, you don't see much inflammation here, but you can see here, the whole hand is red and the patient is allergic to feathers, dogs, cats, horses, so on and so forth. So this is a simple test that you can do it in the outpatient where you can see what you're allergic to and you know what to do. So the treatment for allergic rhinitis is uh, four parts. One, you need to know what you're allergic to. The skin prick test will give you all the information you need and you try to avoid the allergen. For example, if you're allergic to grass, uh, you go outside, you do what you have to do, come back and have a good shower and that will get rid of the allergens. Okay. The other thing, if you're having a lot of house dust mite, you may have to clean the floor, you may have to clean the pillows, you may have to use uh, uh, hypoallergic pillows and so on. So that is called allergen avoidance. The second part is patient education. So if you tell them what they're allergic to, then they will avoid those things. Third thing is uh, medications. And I will tell you what medications work. And the last one is called immunotherapy. And I'll explain that to you in a second. So the normal things which your GP will prescribe is a salt water spray called as the Sterimar or Neil Med Sinus Rinse. This particular saline spray will wash away all the allergens in the nose. You can use it four times daily. If you won't want to waste money, you can e easily make it, take some, buy some syringes, take a glass of warm water, put some salt and rinse your nose, okay? You can use it as many times in a day as possible. The second one is if you are allergic and if you're having a lot of sneezing, why don't you go and get some antihistamines over the counter? We have cytorazine, we have loratadine, we have fexofenadine. The, G, the pharmacist will guide you through the medications as you need. The third one is some doctors might prescribe antihistamine sprays, which is also quite good or they may prescribe a steroid nasal spray. There are different types. I've only put one example, that is Avimus, that is uh, Nasonex, that is uh, Becanase. So the GP will choose uh, any of these spray. They're all equally good, and you can use any of these steroid nasal sprays. Usually two sprays twice daily for about uh, six months to your ear. If your symptoms are worse during summer, you can just take it uh, during the spring and summer season. But if it is all year round, you can still use these sprays. 
don't be afraid steroid you won't put on weight these work only in the nose everything gets excreted so it's very safe the best sprays are dimista or mumitazone spray abimus or fluticasone and uh, becanase nasal spray okay the so i told you patient education is important so the doctor will tell you look you i will prescribe the spray you got to put it inside the nose and face it towards the ear if you do it other way around then it will start rubbing the nose and you may have some nose bleeds so this is where the gps will teach you how to use these sprays that is why i put the column as patient education we need to teach you how to use these sprays now let us say that same patient who has got a severe allergy allergic to so many things not responding to the saline spray not responding to the antihistamine tablets not responding to the steroid sprays not responding to even oral steroids then we go on to the last step called as immunotherapy that means we can desensitize uh, your body to these allergens and that is called as immunotherapy we can desensitize you for pollens for dogs cats horses house dust mite and molds uh they come in two forms one you can have it inside uh, as an injection it is a simple six injections per year or you can have it under the tongue it's called sublingual immunotherapy and this is called as uh, the subcutaneous injection immunotherapy so you can have two forms of immunotherapy one is an injection the other one is drops now i am going to uh, tell you about another scenario here is a 23 year old in the ear jaw on over the temple and it has been ongoing for the last 4 years he, the pain is worse especially while chewing and eating and there is a history of uh, grinding of teeth when she was young and uh, when we look in when we look at her face and when we ask her to open the mouth the jaw goes off to one side a little bit and then when when you put your hand on the jaw joint there is a lot of crackling noise so this condition is called as a temporomandibular joint dysfunction it's basically wear and tear of this jaw joint this is the jaw joint sometimes the muscles around it can cause pain as well so this is condition is called temporomandibular joint dysfunction and uh, the main symptoms the patient will have is pain locking that means whenever they open the mouth it gets locked they have tenderness over this joint and the treatment is usually dental appliance some analgesics relaxation therapy sometimes trigger point injections or steroid injections can be useful in very severe cases we will get an mri scan and we will replace that joint okay moving on uh let us go to the next section the throat section this is a, again a very common scenario i'm sure many of you know a uh, young people who develop a sore throat fever pain on swallowing uh, difficulty with swallowing so they go to the gp the gp has a look inside the mouth and there are a lot of spots in the tonsil that patient the gp checks the temperature the patient has a high temperature so this condition is called acute tonsillitis which i'm sure you all know about it and the treatment for this if they have uh, if it is not uh, if it is there for 3 or 4 days then they would give antibiotics uh, most likely a penicillin antibiotic is the drug of choice now if the patient develops uh, recurrent tonsillitis say seven attacks of tonsillitis in a year each episode lasting say 5 to 10 days the child the patient is miserable had to miss the college frequent absence from uh, college and it's affecting the quality of life then we would recommend an operation it is called tonsillectomy operation i'm sure you know all of this as well now let us take at this example with the throat 30 year old man who loves singing in a band he develops a hoarse voice no brainer uh, is you can easily put two and two together he is overusing his voice he is abusing his voice quite a lot is shouting a lot or is singing a lot he puts more strain on the vocal cords he goes to see his gp the gp refers the patient to us we put a camera and here you can see the right vocal cord and the left vocal cord and you can see small tiny 
spots, white spots, these are the nodules. So this condition is called vocal nodules and the treatment is speech therapy. So the GP might refer or we would refer the patient for speech therapy and also tell the patient how to use the voice, how not to overstrain the voice, how to relax the muscles in the neck and they get better with the simple speech therapy treatment. Let us look at this patient, 60 year old male, develops a hoarse voice and it is gradually getting worse. He is a lifelong smoker. He smokes 15 cigarettes a day and he goes to his GP. The GP examines, even by looking at his voice, he says, I am concerned, my dear chap, let me refer you to the ENT. The ENT, when he comes, we put a camera through the nose and have a look. And you can see here, there is a, a lesion sitting on the left vocal cord. It doesn't look nice. It looks a bit uh, angry as well. It looks like a growth and it is a growth. So this patient has got yeah, uh, throat cancer. So he needs an urgent biopsy. He, we will discuss the patient in the multidisciplinary team meeting. And most likely these patients will respond, will be given radiotherapy. Some patients in advanced cancers will require surgery. So the lesson of the day with this slide is, if you have a hoarse voice for no reason, and it persists for more than say three to four weeks, you should see a doctor. And if the doctor is concerned, he will immediately refer you to us. We will do an urgent examination. And if we are concerned, we will arrange for an urgent biopsy. So that concludes my talk. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you for listening. Saira. Sign up, Dr. Ram. That was very, very helpful presentation. Thank you. And uh, it was very, it was aimed at all the people. I'm sure everybody understood whatever symptoms and things you described. So we've got, I've got a few questions for you. Sure. If you're still feeling energetic. Um, yeah. Somebody would like to know how come sickness and dizziness is connected with the ear? What has it got to do with the ears? Can you explain uh, how ear, ear adds to dizziness and uh, sickness? How does it add to those symptoms? Uh, good question. See, the organ for the balance, they go through into the brain. They go through certain um, structures in the midbrain where there are uh, vomiting centers. So when this inflammation, when this pathway goes through near those centers, the, uh, the vomiting center is stimulated. And when your head is spinning, when you're going round and round in circles, the body feels this, and there is a stimulation of the autonomic system, which stimulates the vomiting centers and causes vomiting. Well, that's brilliant. And does that explain uh, the motion sickness as well? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. have you got any tips for people who suffer from motion sickness and people who feel recurrently dizzy? Okay, that's a very good question. See, the one of the most common cause for dizziness that we see in our clinic is related to motion sickness and migraine. You'll be surprised to know, migraine usually causes headaches, sometimes facial pain, but equally migraine can cause uh, dizziness and vomiting. We have been, uh, only in the last 10 years, this has come more to the front. And if you, the most common cause of dizziness that I see in my clinic, in my tertiary clinic is migraine related vertigo. So if you want to treat that, you first have to identify the trigger factors, what is causing the, uh, the migraine or what is causing this dizziness. It can be cheese, chocolates, red wine, heavy exercise. So the dizziness, usually uh, they don't have a hearing loss, but they feel momentarily dizzy. And this is usually seen in young people. And the treatment for this is simple migraine treatment. Uh, but if they don't respond, they respond well to nortriptyline. So these are the two drugs I use for migraine-related vertigo. But the history is the key. There are other causes for dizziness, like I told you, BPPV. The BPPV lasts only for a few seconds. Labyrinthitis lasts for a few days. Migraine lasts only for a few hours. But migraine doesn't have hearing loss. And I'm sure, uh, Dr. Raja, you know that my uh, dizziness with uh, hearing loss is uh, many years disease. But dizziness without uh, hearing loss is migraine. Yeah. So these. Uh, so the, it is a very common condition. If you are a young uh, person, 
If you are feeling dizziness, it lasts for a few hours. It is usually migraine related. So keep a small diary and say, look at what are the trigger factors. And if you take it to your GP, the GP will be able to identify and say that it is most likely a migraine related vertigo. He will try to treat you. If you don't get better, he will definitely refer you to us. Thank you. A little tip for the people with vertigo, if they have a problem with uh, dizziness, yeah. when they go to sleep, it is worth keeping the lights on at night because sometimes when they get out of bed, they're likely to fall. Yes. Uh, can you explain the reasons for that and uh, give uh, make that tip a bit stronger? See, um, what, see, one of the things I find is... Um, they have to be careful when they when they are dizzy because your body is not oriented to it. So you are you going to our body uh, maintains a balance from three reasons, right? One is through the eyes, one is through the joint sense, and the third one is the balance organ. So imagine if you are having dizzy and your balance organ is not functioning. Now you have to depend on your eyes and the joint sense. So in the night, when you wake up, everything is dark. You don't know your whereabouts, your surroundings are lost, your balance organ is not functioning. So unless you have the use your eyes for your visual uh, sensation, you're going to fall. So that's why they recommend, uh, from what you say, a light in the night will help you not to fall over. Does it make sense? That's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, somebody also wants to know, you, when you're flying in the aircraft or something like that, yeah. you get blocked up ears. And yes. when, you, when you yawn or do something, then your ears seem to open. Uh, yeah. why, how are the ear and the nose connected and what can they do to help themselves? Okay, that's again a good question. See, when you are either, when a flight is going up or uh, going down, normally we all know that there is a eustachian tube. It's a tube which connects your nose to your ear, okay? And normally the air in the ear and the nose are equal. Suppose when you have a slight cold or if you have a blocked nose and you're flying up, that means there is not enough air to equalize in the middle ear. Either the, there is more air in the nose, there is less air in the ear. So now it can't equalize. So the drum gets sucked in. So you feel as though your ears are blocked and there's a lot of pain as well. So when you yawn, you try to open the eustachian tube and the more air goes into the ear, the pressure on either side of the, uh, the nose and the ear, they equalize and you get better. That is why during the flight, we say, if you have a cold or anything, drink plenty of fluids, uh, keep uh, using some chewing gum to keep the eustachian tube open. So these are some other things we tend to recommend uh, when you have a nose problem and if you're getting the recurrent uh, blocked ears when you're flying to try to swallow, so you keep the eustachian tube open. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, this poor lady is having a lot of difficulties and she's asking whether she should sleep in the uh, garage or she should get her husband to sleep in the garage. Uh, he snores very heavily and she cannot sleep and keeps waking her up. Oh, what that's the reason a, for snoring and what can they yeah. do about it? Okay, very good question. See, we see a lot of patients with snoring. Uh, usually the partner is the one who doesn't like that snoring and they have to sleep separately. Uh, but the husband will say, I am fast asleep, doctor. I, it has nothing to do with me but usually it causes marital disharmony. See, snoring, uh, there are, usually it occurs in people, either they are putting on too much weight, that's one factor which predisposes. Snoring uh, is only the beginning of the spectrum. Some people will just have snoring. Some people, they tend to fall asleep during the day, or when you ask them to read a paper, they won't be able to complete it. Or when they are watching a television, within 10 minutes, they are fast asleep or they start taking more frequent afternoon naps, or if you ask them to sit quietly for some ten, after, within 10, 15 minutes, they tend to fall asleep. So these are the warning sim symptoms. So when you have simple snoring, it's just a noise. But when you have snoring with sleep apnea, that means daytime sleepiness, you should see a doctor who will arrange a sleep study. The snoring can come from either from the nose or from the throat. So if you see a doctor, they will examine the nose, they will examine the throat, and then they will give the right treatment. If you have a lot of sleep apnea, you need a CPAP machine, and it works very well. But most importantly, you've got to reduce the weight. Whoever it is, if they are overweight, they definitely have to go for a weight reduction regime. Thank you. Is it particularly dangerous in long-distance lorry drivers and people like that? Uh, yeah, it can happen. But I've seen... Uh, 
in other occupations as well, sir, you're right, uh, long distance lorry divers, but also uh, when people eat uh, and they're overweight, they are very, very common. Uh, they put themselves at risk for snoring and sleep apnea. Can you tell us something about deviated <laughs> nasal septum? Yeah, that's very simple. You, our nose consists of the right and left nostril. They are separated by the septum. And uh, it is normally not 100% straight in all of us. It's always slightly squint. But some people with a history of trauma to the nose, or they may have a spontaneous uh, bent nose. And if they have underlying allergic rhinitis, then the nose gets really blocked. Usually they present with a blockage on one side of the nose. When the GP looks inside, he can see a very bent septum. And it's a simple problem. He would give sprays first. If they don't get better, he will refer them to us. And we will do a simple operation and straighten the nose. It's a called septoplasty operation. And it gives a fantastic result, 98% success. Yeah. Um, you did touch on the cleaning of the ears. It's probably not a good idea to clean your ears too much because otherwise the wax is just going to fall into the ears rather than come out. So it's not really helpful. But what about doing it for the children? Because uh, quite often mums clean children's ears and things like that. Is that a good idea or should we not do it? Uh, well, if you're asking uh, the professional, they'll always say no. Because you do, even though mother tries, see, we can see the edge of the bud. As you're trying to take it out, some wax get pushed in. So you can use simple wax drops. No, What is stopping at night when they're going to sleep, just put one or two olive oil drops and they get better. And for the wax in the ears, there's something called microsuction that some GPs do. Yeah. Uh, is that much better than ear syringing? And is it worth having it done privately if the GPs are not uh, you know, able to fit the appointments okay. and things? See, syringing is uh, not a bad idea, but you got to know the right technique. Um, if you do it correctly, it works very well. But sometimes if you misdirect it, you can create a perforation. I've seen, not that I'm saying, I've seen a few patients. Most of the time, syringing goes fine. But I've seen a few patients with ear perforation, a lot of pain. They come back and saying, I had this syringing. It didn't get better. Microsection is what I showed you in the slide. No, that's the nurse with looking with the microscope. We can see better. We will wash the ear with some drops and we'll suck it out. Uh, so microsuction is also a good idea. If you have a private people who does some uh, microsuction, it's not a bad option. So between syringing and microsuction, my personal choice would be microsuction. Okay. Can you tell us something more about hearing aids and which ones are good and which ones are worth going for? Are they, is it worthwhile going for more expensive one private ones or should we just stick to the NHS ones? Okay, so uh, that again is, uh, the, see, at the end of the day, you want to hear better. And uh, all the NHS hearing aids are digital hearing aids. They are programmable hearing aids. They are quite good hearing aids. The only thing is there are called uh, inset hearing aids. The only thing is they have a small uh, thing which goes behind the ear. People can hardly see. Uh, but if you are very particular that you don't want those hearing aids, you can have a hearing aid which sits inside the ear canal. They all have their own advantages and disadvantages. Your digital hearing aid behind the ear hearing aid, although it may look a little bit cumbersome, they are very easy to take it out and put it back in. If you're having a very fine in the ear hearing aid, then it may be a little bit, uh, you may not be able to hear as well as you should, but some are professionals in there in the very high profile meetings. They don't want people to know that they got a hearing aid they can invest that money, but there are different types. The most important ones are behind the ear and in the ear and in the canal hearing aids. Yeah, it's the, uh, uh, but I would say if you don't waste money uh, and I don't think it makes a big difference whether you have in the ear hearing aids or behind, I, I don't personally want people to waste uh, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 pounds unless you are a very, very rich person. I would say if you're not, Cosmetically too concerned, a simple behind the ear hearing aid is more than enough. Yeah. The next one is quite an interesting uh, mm. problem. Uh, quite often I go to elderly people's houses and I ring the bell hundreds of times and bang on the door and they can't hear me. So when I go inside, I find that the hearing aids are sitting on top of the television. Uh, <laughs> can you give us some tips about how one can get used to that because they seem to find it quite difficult and they don't seem to want to use it or they say well we, we put put them on when we go outside or when we listen to tv or something but it's very for some reason they don't seem to tolerate it how can one get used to that and make the best use of the hearing aids 
um i said so i think the the more per, see when i always tell my patient look when you're getting a hearing aid uh, you will not be used to it immediately patience practice and uh, also uh, it may need to be you need to see the audiologist maybe once or twice to get it programmed fine tune it people tend to buy it and then they start using it and they may not tune it properly and they may struggle so you need to have at least a few months of patience to do it regularly practice it and the more you it also depends on how severe the hearing loss is but your friendly audiologist should be able to tune the hearing aids to that extent they can adjust so that you can use it better and you got to practice it sir yeah so the trick is to practice and keep trying until you get it absolutely perfectly not only practicing but to see the audiologist to program it it's not the patient's fault sometimes they it needs a little bit of fine tuning okay um somebody is asking about um, recurrent polyps and how often can they be treated and is there a limit to how many surgeries you have that's a very good question uh see uh there are three types of patients there is one patient with simple polyps and uh, if you do a steroid uh, sorry good medications and good surgery you may not need surgery for 10 15 years there is a group number 2 polyps with asthma they may need second surgery they may not there is a third group where they have polyps and they have asthma they are allergic to aspirin and brufen so these are the bad patients they form polyps very quickly so the history is very important and these patients the last group the bad group you got to give them medical treatment you got to operate on them you can desensitize them to aspirin it's called aspirin desensitization and nowadays we are also getting a drug uh, called biological treatments these are very latest immunotherapy drugs for a very severe polyps where it is not controlling at all this particular biological treatment works wonders it has just come out and we are using in uk for the last 2 years 3 years or so uh so that is the biological treatment for very severe polyps who needs multiple surgery like what you said can you tell us very briefly about the foreign body in the nose especially of children yeah uh the, the basic thing is is very simple sir if the foreign body is stuck in the nose you take them to the doctor the doctor will refer to us and if we can fish it out we will have special instruments to fish it out if we can see it but if it is quite stuck we'll have to give a general anesthesia put the child to sleep and take it out and sometimes they don't even realize that they've got a foreign body and they have uh, discharge uh, recurrently yeah. and we treat that them is, with antibiotics we are we are always taught that when a child has a unilateral that means one sided nasal discharge uh, smelly discharge always think of a foreign body as a first differential diagnosis yes and on the same note you did mention an emergency of one sided hearing loss Uh, yeah. maybe if you can cover that once again and it, does the same thing apply to the one sided tinnitus as well yes no well now how can i tell that i've got tinnitus on one ear or the other one because it's quite difficult to tell no the tinnitus is not urgent but it requires a scan okay so if a patient says a doctor i i hear this buzzing noise only in my right ear they will be able to say uh, uh dr radia so uh, it is a so unilateral sorry one sided hearing loss is an emergency one sided tinnitus is not a uh, emergency but you need to see the doctor and we need to do a scan for these patient now there are two types of noises some people will hear like a heartbeat not heartbeat like a whoosh 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 that means it is something to do with the blood vessels in the brain or in the ear there is another noise where they have the buzzing or a ringing noise only in one ear that is uh that is also the reason why we need to do a scan so any noise that you hear in only one ear needs thorough examination thorough investigation and so, uh, can i ask you something about um, bad breath what the cause is and if there's anything we can do about it bad breath can be due to um, it can come from the tongue it can be, come from vitamin deficiencies it can come from tonsillitis it can come from stones in the tonsils so if they look inside the mouth and if we see if they see small specks of uh, debris in the tonsil that is the most common cause for halitosis uh, or bad breath the treatment is mouth washes and in the nhs we used to do operations for them we used to remove the tonsils they have no longer recommending that so they have to get the tonsils removed privately if they find the tonsil stones 
the treatment for solids, tonsil stones is uh, mouthwashes. And if they don't respond to that, maybe a tonsillectomy operation. But if there, there are other causes for uh, bad breath, if the tonsils looks normal, they have to see uh, an oral surgeon or an oromaxillary facial surgeon. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit more about antihistamines and long-term use and which ones are better and non-sedating and sedating ones or anything like that? Yeah, in the slide, whatever I put, they're all non-sedating ones. The piritan, you must have heard of the name piritan. That is a sedating one. All these, fexofenadine, cetirizine, and uh, loratadine, they're all non-second generation. They are non-sedating ones. You can use any one. The cheapest and equally potent is cetirizine. It's cheap, but it is as good as the loratadine and fexofenadine. So, and you can buy it over the counter. I don't want you to waste money. Try that. If it doesn't work, you can switch on to loratadine or fexofenadine through your GP. Thank you. And you can use it for a long time without being worried about addiction or anything like that? No, sir. I have used it on my patients for many years. No problems. And the last question for the day is, um, should parents and everybody expect antibiotics for tonsillitis and things like that? What are your views? Good question. See, uh, sore throat is a very common uh, thing. Fever with sore throat usually settles down with painkillers. It's caused by a virus. Unless the sore throat lasts for more than, say, four or five days, then and you see lots of spots in the tonsil and your painkillers are not helping, your mouthwashes are not helping, you should see a doctor and get penicillin antibiotic. This is what the studies have shown. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Ram. You have uh, exhausted all the questions and answered all the queries very happily. And we have had a very good presentation and learned a lot about ENT. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Adia. Thank and you thank very everyone much. for listening patiently and for all the questions that you provided. Sairam. Sairam, sir. Thank you, sir. Have a nice day. Thank you, Sairam.